Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, for that introduction. Um, about my bowling, all I would say is that the captain lost his faith in my ability when I bowled my first delivery in goal and hit second slip on his shin. <laughs> Mr. President, my lords, ladies, and gentlemen, firstly, I wish to sincerely thank the MCC for giving me the opportunity and the great honor of delivering the 2011 Cowdery Lecture. I was in India after the World Cup when my manager called to pass on the message that CMJ was trying to get in touch with me to see whether I would like to deliver this year's lecture. I was initially hesitant given the fact that we would be in the midst of the current ODI series, but after some reflection, I realized that it was an invitation I should not turn down. To be the first Sri Lankan to be invited was not only a great honor for me, but also for my countrymen. Then I had to choose my topic. I suspect many of you might have anticipated that I picked one of the many topics being energetically debated today, the role of technology, the governance of the game, the future of test cricket, and the curse of corruption, especially spot fixing. All of the above are important, and no doubt, Sir Colin Cowdery, a cricketing legend with a deep affection for the game, would have strong opinions about them all. For the record, I do too. I strongly believe that we have reached a critical juncture in the game's history, and that unless we better sustain test cricket, embrace technology enthusiastically, protect the game's global governance from narrow self-interest, and more aggressively root out corruption, then cricket will face an uncertain future. But while these would all be interesting topics, deep down inside me, I wanted to share with you a story. The story of Sri Lanka's cricket, a journey that I'm sure Colin would have enjoyed greatly because I don't believe any cricket playing nation in the world today better highlights the potential of cricket to be more than just a game. This lecture is all about the spirit of the game. And in this regard, the story of Sri Lankan cricket is fascinating. Cricket in Sri Lanka is no longer just a sport. It is a shared passion that is a source of fun and a force for unity. It is a treasured sport that occupies a celebrated place in our society. It is remarkable that in a very short period, an alien game has become a national obsession, played and followed with almost fanatical passion and love, a game that brings the nation to a standstill, a sport so powerful it is capable of transcending war and petty politics. I therefore decided that tonight I would like to talk about the spirit of Sri Lankan cricket. Ladies and gentlemen, the history of my country extends over 2,500 years. A beautiful island, rich in natural resources, it is situated in an advantaged strategic position in the Indian Ocean. It has long attracted the attentions of the world at times to our disadvantage and at times to our prosperity. It is beautiful and it is inhabited by a wonderfully resilient and vibrant and hospitable people whose attitude to life has been shared by volatile politics both internal and from without. In our history, you will find periods of glorious peace and prosperity and times of great strife, <coughs> war and violence. Sri Lankans have been hardened by experience and have shown themselves to be a resilient and proud society celebrating at all times a zest for life and living. Sri Lankans are a close-knit community. The strength of the family unit reflects the spirit of our communities. We are inquisitive. We are a fun-loving people, smiling defiantly in the face of hardship and raucously celebrating times of prosperity. We live not for tomorrow, but for today. 
savoring every breath of our daily existence. We are fiercely proud of our heritage and culture, the ordinary Sri Lankan standing tall and secure in that knowledge. Over 400 years of colonization by the Portuguese, the Dutch, and the British has failed to crush or temper our indomitable spirit. And yet, in this context, the influence upon our recent history and society by the introduced sport of cricket is surprising and noteworthy. Sri Lankans for centuries have fiercely resisted westernization of our society, at times summarily dismissing Western tradition and influence as evil and detrimental. Yet cricket somehow managed to slip through the crack in the anti-Western defenses in our society and has now become the most precious heirloom of a British colonial inheritance. It may be because it is a result of our simple sense of hospitality, where a guest is treated to all that we have and at times even to what we don't have. If you visit a rural Sri Lankan home and you are served a cup of tea, you will find it to be intolerably sweet. I have times experienced this myself. And upon further inquiry have found that it is because the hosts believe that the guest is entitled to more of everything, including the sugar. <laughs> In homes where sugar is an ill-affordable luxury, a guest will still receive sugary tea while the hosts go without. Fittingly, as it happens, Colin Cowdery's and Sri Lanka's love for cricket had similar origins, tea. Colin's father, Ernest, was a tea planter in India. While he was schooled in England, he played on his father's plantation where I am told he used to practice with Indian boys several years his elder. Cricket was introduced to Ceylon by men like Ernest. English tea planters during the colonial period of occupation that's covered a span of about 150 years from 1796. Credit for the game's establishment in Sri Lanka, though, also has to be given to the Anglican missionaries to whom the colonial government left the function of establishing the educational institutions. By the latter half of the 19th century, there grew a large group of Sri Lankan families who accumulated wealth by making use of the commercial opportunities thrown open by the colonial government. However, a majority of these families could not gain any high social recognition due to the prevalence of a rigid hierarchical caste system which labeled them until death to the caste they were born into. A possible way to escape caste stigma was to pledge their allegiance to the British Crown and help the central seat of government. The missionaries, assessing the situation wisely, opened superior fee levying English schools, especially in Colombo, for the children of the affluent from all races, castes, and religions. By the dawn of the 20th century, the introduction of cricket to this educational system was automatic, as the game had already ingrained itself deeply into the English life as Neville Carter said, without cricket, there can be no summer in that land. Cricket was an expensive game, needing playgrounds, equipment, and coaches. The British missionaries provided all such facilities to these few schools. Cricket became an instant success in this English school system. Most Sri Lankans considered cricket beyond their reach because it was confined to the privileged schools meant for the affluent. The missionaries, in due course, arranged intercollegiate cricket matches backed by newspaper coverage to become a popular weekend social event to attend. The newspapers carried all details about the cricket matches played in the country and outside. As a result, schoolboy cricketers became household names. The newspapers also gave prominent coverage to English county cricket, and it has been often said that the Ceylonese knew more of county cricket than the English themselves. Cricket clubs were formed around the dawn of the 20th century, designed to cater for the school leavers of these colleges. 
the clubs bore communal names like the Sinhalese Sports Club, the Tamil Union, the Burger Recreation Club, and the Moors Club. But if they were considered together, they were all uniformly cultured with anglicized values. Inter-club matches were played purely for enjoyment. Club cricket also opened opportunities for the locals to mix socially with the British. So when Britain granted independence to Ceylon in 1948, it is no wonder cricket was a passion of the elitist class. Although in the immediate post-independent period, the, Anglica and the anglicized elite class was a small minority. They were pro-Western in their political ideology and remained a powerful political lobby. In the general elections immediately after independence, pro-elite governments were elected, and the three prime ministers who headed the governments had played first 11 cricket for premier affluent colleges and had been the members of the SSC. The period between 1960 to 1981 was one of slow progress in the game's popularity as the power transferred from the anglicized elite to rising socialist and nationalist groups. Nevertheless, Sri Lanka Ways was made an associate member of the ICC in 1965, gaining the opportunity to play unofficial test matches with players like Michael Tissera and Anurad Tenakorn, impressing as genuine world-class batsmen. In 1981, thanks to the efforts of the late Honorable Garmini Disanayaka, the ICC granted Sri Lanka official test status. It was obviously a pivotal time in our cricketing history, and this was the start of a transformation of cricket from an elite sport to a game for the masses. I do not remember this momentous occasion as a child. Maybe because I was only five years old, but also because it wasn't a topic that dominated conversation in our home. The early 1980s was dominated by the, ex the, by the escalation of militancy in the North into a full-scale civil war that was to mar the next 30 years. The terrible race riots of 1983 and a bloody communist insurgency amongst the youth was to darken my memories of my childhood and the lives of all Sri Lankans. I recollect now the race riots of 1983 with horror. But for the simple imagination of a child not yet six, it was a time of extended play and fun. I do not say this lightly, as about 35 of our closest friends, all Tamils, took shelter in our home. They needed sanctuary from vicious, politically motivated goon squads, and my father, like many other Sri Lankans from different ethnic backgrounds, opened their houses at great personal risk. For me, though, it was a time where I had all my friends to play with all day long. The schools were closed, and we play sport for hour after hour in the backyard. Cricket, football, rounders, it was a child's dream come true. I remember getting annoyed when a game would be rudely interrupted by my parents, and we'd all be ushered inside, hidden upstairs with our friends, and ordered to be silent as the goon squads started searching homes in our neighborhood. I did not realize the terrible consequences of my friends being discovered and my father reminded me the other day of how one day, during that period, I turned to him and in all innocence said, I hope this happens every year because it's so much fun having my friends to play with every day.